everyone and welcome. Let me know where you're joining from. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Ina Hussein, who is an incredible board certified otolaryngologist with a further subspecialty in laryngology. And she's a specialist in LPR, reflux, voice, voice, airway, and swallow. I'm just gonna make sure we invite her in. She has been trained at Northwestern and Harvard. She has published over 30 peer reviewed articles and she's an international speaker and a global specialist in reflux here. I'm gonna just add her in. So happy you're here. But anyway, oh, I think you're still I think it works. Hey, Molly, how are you? Oh, how are you? I'm good. Let me just try to. Okay. Can you see yeah. me? Okay, you perfect. See. Yeah, hi. Perfect. Great to see you. How are you? Good. I'm doing well. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about the technical difficulties. No worries. <laughs> um, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Yeah, great. Awesome. So I was just introducing you in our topic today. Um, anything else you want to share before we dive in? No, I think let's dive in. Um, yeah. So, um, the title of this, this conversation is silent reflux. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great place to start of just like explaining what is silent reflux. Cause it's probably a lot of term that most people haven't, haven't heard. Sure. So I, I like to break that term down into like each component, right? So silent means that we likely don't know it's happening. Okay. It doesn't mean that we're not feeling it. We just don't know we're feeling it. And then reflux is actually the process of whatever is in your stomach coming out into the esophagus and even up into the throat. So this process, it can be incredibly inflammatory. Um, traditionally, we think of that inflammation as affecting our esophagus or our stomach, causing the symptoms of like heart burn and indigestion. But what a lot of people don't understand is that that inflammatory response can actually happen in what's called your upper aerodigestive tract. Fancy word, but it basically means like the throat, the airway, the vocal cords, all the way up to your nose and your sinuses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so a lot of people with, um, with silent reflux, there, it also is called laryngopharyngeal reflux or respiratory reflux because there can also be like respiratory challenges right. associated with Yeah, right? so that same reflux, because it's so inflammatory, can affect the lungs mm -hmm. and how we breathe. And so those, it can contribute to a lot of respiratory symptoms, mm -hmm. including things like shortness of breath and chronic cough. Um, there's even some studies that show correlation with things like asthma because, again, it's an inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. It can be confusing too, right? Because the symptoms of LPR might sometimes feel like allergies or feel like something else. So when is a sign you might want to get this looked at or what would be your first steps and maybe some signals? Yeah, so for from an ear, nose, and throat standpoint, since I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, I mean, we definitely look for like persistence of symptoms, especially things like throat symptoms. So a lot of times, like with allergies and sinus, you won't get isolated throat symptoms. You'll get nasal symptoms along with potentially throat symptoms, mm -hmm. and it's fair to undergo kind of the sinonasal or allergy pathway for those type of symptoms. But a lot of patients actually don't feel anything in their nose at all, and they just come in with these isolated isolated. Like, I assumed it was allergies, but then you ask them, well, was your nose ever stuffy? Was it ever runny? Do you get facial pain and pressure? And they're like, no, it was just the post-nasal drip making me clear and cough. And that's often a really suspicious sign that it actually might not be your sinuses or allergies at all. That's actually a process that's directly irritating the throat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And when we talk about directly irritating throat, can you talk a little bit more about pepsin? Yeah. And its role in, in that throat irritation? Yep. So anything, so pepsin is a kind of a digestive enzyme that should really only be found in the stomach. When there's a reflux event, again, whatever is in the stomach, including things like pepsin and other non-acidic digestive enzymes can actually come up. Now that can make its way all the way up to the throat in kind of a gaseous form. And that's why often it's silent because it's like a gas that's coming up. Mm -hmm. There are lots of studies. So pepsin is often used as a marker for what we call laryngopharyngeal reflux or LPR in the research world, where tissue samples have been tested for pepsin and found in patients with things like chronic rhinosinusitis, um, otitis media, which means fluid in the ears. So we know pepsin, there's no reason pepsin should be up there 
except for a reflux event. So it can be incredibly inflammatory when it touches tissue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And how would someone know if they had like pepsin mediated laryngo yeah. reflux? Yeah, so it's actually really difficult to know that. I mean, the first step is always the kind of um, suspicion, right? So unfortunately, a lot of patients, this isn't even brought to the table, right? So once you kind of find a provider, and we're doing our best with education to get the word out there about these type of effects of reflux, but once you suspect it, there is diagnostic testing that can be done. Currently, the gold standard is what we call a 24-hour pH impedance test. It's where a catheter or probe is placed in the nose, sits in the esophagus for 24 hours. This probe has the ability to not only measure movement, which we call reflux, but also whether that movement is acidic, non-acidic, which would make us suspicious for pepsin then, and if there's actually a symptom correlation, right? So when you um, give feedback of when you're having the event, was there an event preceding that? Um, there's also a newer test that I started telling patients about. Um, it's called pepsin check. Um, it used to be called pep test. Um, it was only available in the UK. A US company who also makes the ResTech device recently acquired it. So now patients in the US, you don't need a prescription to get it. You can actually order it directly from the company. And it's a salivary test where you provide saliva samples and they can measure it for pepsin. Now, no test is perfect. So I don't want you know people going out and saying, well, I didn't have pepsin, so I don't have reflux. It doesn't work that way. But if there is pepsin, it's really sensitive for it. Um, so it's definitely a test to kind of see if there's pepsin that you can do that's non-invasive. Otherwise, we still consider the 24 pH impedance test as the gold standard. Yeah, absolutely. That's really helpful to know. This And this might be a tricky question, but how does the pH impedance uh, result look different for someone with, with LPR, silent re reflux versus GERD? Is it really the typically non-acid, like proximal, the, the reflux is coming up very high? What, is, what does the difference so we, usually look like? Use, we use a special probe that has sensors that go all the way up to the throat. So that's one of the keys if you're really doing this test for throat mm -hmm. symptoms. Make mm -hmm. sure you have the probe that has the throat sensor. So we're really looking for those reflux events, not just happening what we call distally or near the stomach, but actually making their way up proximal to the throat. So that's one kind of difference between it. Um, and then also we're looking for kind of that non-acid reflux. Um, a lot of times we'll do this test like on patients with, for example, acid suppression. And so you'll see that most of that reflux therefore will be non-acid because you're suppressing the acid. Mm. Okay, but is that result, if someone is on a PPI, does it mean it's not necessarily accurate to the true nature of their reflux? Because it will be non-acidic, like if they're right. on acid. So what I think we use this in context of why we're doing mm -hmm. the test. And remember, you can have GERD and LPR, or you can just have isolated LPR. And a lot of that is based on kind of symptom profile. Mm -hmm. A lot of patients undergo what's known as an upper endoscopy for screening. And so if they find things like Barrett's, then we put you in the category of GERD as well as LPR. So we need some evidence that you know, where is necessarily the damage and where are the symptoms? And so with the pH impedance, I definitely kind of individualize it. Sometimes we'll do it on a totally um, naive patient, meaning no acid suppression. And those are usually the patients who are like, I've never had GERD, I've never had heartburn. Well, we're not gonna do the test on a proton pump inhibitor then, right? right. But I have other patients who have a known history of GERD, but everyone feels like it's being controlled but they're still having throat symptoms. Those are the patients where I really wanna identify if there's any reflux at all. And most likely it'll be non-acid if there is. Yeah. yeah, okay, really, really great point. And so with that example of, of someone on, on PPI, maybe history of GERD now having LPR symptoms, which is something I see a lot, um, what's the next step like for you medically yeah. with that person? So if we identify that there is reflux um, coming up, so the question always becomes what's the root cause or why is there reflux happening? And you don't have to have that conversation after a pH impedance test, right? Like a pH impedance test, it's, it's not available everywhere. It is invasive. Obviously, insurance is involved. It can be, you know, a whole thing. So trying to find the root cause of reflux, even before you confirm reflux, is not bad necessarily. So what we're really looking for are like anatomical reasons, right? Does somebody have something like a hiatal hernia? Um, do they have evidence of a weak lower esophageal sphincter? 
Is it primarily the diet that's triggering mechanical reflux or lifestyle? Um, certain medications can trigger it. Obviously, stress, anxiety triggers reflux as well. And so we really try to find the root cause. And so when we create a treatment plan for patients, my practice is very individualized. Like I really wish I could have like an algorithm that I could give a one sheet and print it and give it to all physicians in the world yes. who do LPR. But I think that that's really just not doing justice to kind of the individual individuality that occurs with LPR, since there's so much we don't know about it. And so often patients are given this multimodal approach that we, we spend extensive time talking about diet and lifestyle. I often recru uh, recruit registered dietitians such as yourself, Molly, to really hone in on those, you know, that's your area of expertise with these patients. Um, we go through medication lists, we go through, you know, making sure they've had an upper endoscopy to make sure I'm ruling out kind of precancer changes, H. pylori, um, and then once we gather information, we can come up with, well, these are the priorities in terms of how you should manage it. Now, most people, well, patients can do really well with lifestyle changes and diet and behavior, but there's obviously a group of patients who try all of that and they're still having symptoms. And so that's where we start to add on kind of what we call supplements. And so my favorite one are what we call alginates made out of algae, so like seaweed. Um, the one I talk a lot about is reflux um, raft because it is what's called an enhanced alginate. So it's not just the algae. They have some other products which help, um, all natural, that help with other areas of digestive health. Now, I think we're doing a really good job about educating about alginates because we are on a little bit of a back order, unfortunately, this summer um, with reflux raft, but hoping it will be back soon in the next couple of weeks. Um, they have a great nighttime version since nighttime reflux can be so challenging for patients that adds a little bit of melatonin, not to help with sleep, but actually to help strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter. So that's why we call it an enhanced alginate. These alginates, because they're all natural, it's a great option for patients who are kind of easing into, you know, not ready to take a lot of medication with potential side effects. Um, they want to try something maybe before um, diagnostic testing is available for them. So it's it's a great option. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, super, super important details you mentioned. And I love that the alginate acts like uh, locally in, in the body. Like it doesn't, instead of a PPI, which kind of decreases overall stomach acid production, which can result in a lot of, um, you know, it, a lot of things for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. This really just acts at the lower subgeal junction, mm -hmm. creates that barrier to, to block, the, to help prevent the reflux, which is really helpful for especially LPR, um, because like we said, it's not, it's not, the acid isn't the only problem. It really is the act of the stomach contents moving up into the esophagus, which containing pepsin that can be really, really in, in, irritating. So the alginate can really help provide that extra layer of protection along with like you said, nutrition, lifestyle changes. And it sounds like you have a really holistic and comprehensive like assessment when you're looking at a person, mm -hmm. thinking about the, the structure of the person, but also other underlying issues like H. pylori or um, even constipation that's putting more pressure on, on the abdomen. There's so many factors that mm -hmm. um, we could potentially modify to help people get relief, even if there is a structural abnormality. Percent. I always tell patients we definitely have things we can try, right? So being diagnosed with like a hiatal hernia shouldn't be like the end of it for you, right? Like mm -hmm. I have lots of patients who are like, well, I'm just never going to get symptom relief because I have a hiatal hernia. And it's like, that's actually not mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. um, I think both of us have spoken about our journey with reflux and LPR and digestive health. And I think that just makes it, you know, I wouldn't want to sit somewhere and be told, this is the only thing you can do for LPR, right? And you're just kind of stuck on this antacid for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, we're females, calcium, osteoporosis, these are issues. People are hopefully living longer. We know that acid is important to help maintain good microbiome, which then protects you against things like pneumonia. Um, I think we just need to have these conversations with our patients. Yeah, absolutely. And, and from, from my perspective, too, there's always things we can work on. And, um, you know, nobody is, is perfect in their in their lifestyle and their nutrition. And there's always things that we can work on. Um, stress, also a big one. Managing mm -hmm. stress is super key. And another example of even if you have a hernia issue, even if you have a lower soft shield sphincter issue, it really does help to, you know, really think about nutrition and lifestyle and personalize this to you and manage stress to, to help your sphincters function well, help your digestion function well.
hundred percent. And I know we've both spoken about the like benefits of like diaphragmatic breathing mm. or belly breathing. I mean, um, studies have shown that it can help strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter. We love belly breathing for a host of um, like laryngeal issues with both voice and vocal cord tension and tightness and shortness of breath. And so, you know, again, all natural, like it's just about finding the right kind of protocol for you and mm -hmm. what's what you can incorporate into your life. Right, right. And personalizing it in your own day to day life, like diaphragmatic breathing post to me all has been really helpful. Um, like you said, has been shown to help strengthen, strengthen the sphincter, strengthen the diaphragm. Um, and so love using that. And then also has the added benefit of, of helping kind of reduce stress throughout the day is having those little intervals, whether that's after a meal or maybe during your lunch break. It's a great, it's another great free thing to, to add in. Awesome. Um, awesome. And um, one other question that, that I think we had submitted mm -hmm. was just about, um, you know, who's the best uh, person to see medically? So yeah. in, you know, we, I mentioned that you're a laryngologist, and I think a lot of people are struggling to find a laryngologist in their area. Mm -hmm. And so I think it might be helpful to have some tips on maybe how to find one. Yeah. To be so um, I will tell you that this is definitely kind of a struggle in terms of like, no one really owns LPR, right? So um, GERD is definitely owned by our gastroenterologists. Um, I will say within the field of laryngology, um, you know, bronchoesophagology is kind of part of that, which means kind of like trachea um, as well as kind of esophagus. And so I think not all laryngologists necessarily are interested in LPR or take the same approach. But I think if you have, the reason I always recommend going to a laryngologist though is because we're talking about throat symptoms. And the very first part of the conversation is always getting a really good exam because the symptoms of LPR are non-specific. It's very, very important for people to understand that those are just symptoms of a throat that's not happy, but it doesn't prove that that not being happy is from reflux. And so that's why a good nasal and laryngeal exam are so important because we want to look at the structure, we want to look at the function. And so ear, ear, nose, and throat doctors can do that in general, and laryngologists make it, may perhaps take it one step further if there's like hoarseness and stuff. So it's definitely really important to get that exam with an ear, nose, and throat doctor. The way I recommend finding laryngologists is that you look for generally things like voice programs, voice centers, because laryngology is often thought of as like the voice doctors because the larynx is the voice box. And so often in departments, if you find an ENT department near you, say, hey, who's the voice doctor in this group? And that's the laryngologist. Um, there are lots of GIs across the country who are taking an interest in LPR, do a lot of work in that. So it's not not necessarily wrong, but I will tell you if your primary symptoms are throat without using the word heartburn or stomach problems, it's going to get, it's going to be harder to find a GI doctor to listen, frankly speaking, right? Just like if um, someone came in my clinic and they're talking to me all about like their skin, I'm going to be like, I don't know if you're in the right place. Right. right. So it's kind of the same idea. So that's why I always recommend ear, nose and throat. If you can find a laryngologist, even better. Um, and then you go from there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this was really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, anything else you wanted to address today or anything else you wanted to share? Yeah, we... I think, you know, the more and more we're studying and learning about LPR, we're finding more and more symptoms can potentially be attributed to it. Um, so like I mentioned, like ear infections, eustachian mm -hmm. tube dysfunction, again, those are all just symptoms of irritation. And the main thing is what's causing that irritation. So um, I think, you know, definitely needs to be on the differential um, for a lot of these head and neck kind of symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like, I think what can happen too when the symptoms don't necessarily feel like the classic symptoms of mm -hmm. reflux, we, we forget that it is being caused by reflux. So it's really important, all of the nutrition and lifestyle strategies that we talk about in terms of reflux prevention, those are really still like should be part of the, the mainstay of treatment. Definitely, 100 percent Get to the root cause of it and address yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, yeah, if, if people want to find more about you and your work, where's the best place for them to go? Um, probably my Instagram. I post a lot of information out there about, um, about LPR and then also about my clinical practice.
Perfect. Okay. So I will, I will tag in a down below and thank you again for your thanks. time. This was super, super Smiley, helpful. Thanks so much. Okay. Take, take care. care. Bye. Take care. Bye.